when I was looking at all this, this week, just meditating on, because I want to believe God. Uh, I think I've tried to do that ever since I've been in this thing. I just want to trust him. But there are things that I, that I don't know, but did know, but didn't know. You know, I, I, it's like God doesn't give us a, a straight shot, like write a letter, point A, point B. It would be good if he would just say, now, here go, here what you do, Kelly. Do this and this and this and that. But he lays it all out in the book. Healing in one place, deliverance in one place, and salvation, and all kind of things. And it almost looked like there is no real flow of faith like things just happen. Because most of us believe things just happen, right? We, we just believe that there's a bunch of accidents going on in our lives. Because see, really how we imagine ourselves in God is really what we get. Our imagination has either helped us or hurt us. 90% of most people will never be healed because they really can't imagine God doing it. The idea is great. That's why I think that when he talks about knowing God, knowing him, it's very important. There's never going to be faith without intimacy with God, period. You're never going to have faith in God without getting with God. I realize that even today, I read a book, which I haven't read in a long time because I, I think sometimes we've got so much information we are definitely never going to be transformed by You'll never be transformed by somebody else's idea about God. They may help you, but their word is not his word. They wrote a book. And you know what we'd rather do? We would rather read what somebody else said about God than to go to God and know him for ourselves. Right? I, I, I got books. You know why I bought those books? They were good books. Yeah, they were good books. Man, all that information I took in. But I woke up one day and realized I had a whole lot of information, but very little change. See, God don't care about all the information you're gathering about him. He wants to know, do you want to know me? And so in 1993, or thereabouts, it's when I realized, man, I was amassing a lot of knowledge, a lot of information. But the more information I gathered, it done the wrong thing. It did not produce the passion of Jesus. It done more to produce a pride in myself. I know, you know, people don't like to tell the truth, but I tell the truth. I knew that I was not an average preacher. I knew that I studied. And I knew that I studied a lot. And I had a lot of information. And I preached a lot of that information all over the country. But you know what we have become? Addicted to information and not addicted to God. We can spend, so people, you know, we, we even came down and said, well, you know, uh, most people when we got our TVs or whatever, started watching TV, we kind of like justified it. I'm watching Christian programming. It's if you, and then we'll turn around and talk about, boy, I believe in the truth, but it didn't matter who was on Christian television. First of all, when I made statements about stuff like that, I said, ain't no such thing 
as a Christian television or even Christian radio. Oh, there I go. It's media. Did, did you know, and, and you know what's really bad? God don't want a medium between you and him. Did you know that? Hearing a medium is not hearing God. I'm not saying don't listen to people. It's fine. I listen to people all the time. But I have to realize one thing. My relationship with God is with God. And I appreciate even hearing other people talk about the same God. But my medium is not networks. None of that. Because most people today still don't know God because they know the networks. Oh, I know he's a great author. One of my friends right now, he's teaching on Facebook. Straight from the guy's book. I ain't say they can't use a book. But my information to you means absolutely nothing if it hadn't passed through my system. I cannot preach conviction or teach conviction without it first. I being first partaker of it. I, I can tell you all kinds of things and make you shout about faith and believe in God, but that doesn't do anything. It's dead words if it hadn't come through here first. So we've got to realize there are things that we've got to do. I hate to say got to do because we missed the first step. Somehow or another, we want to miss the first step and then make everything right. What is the first step in God? What, what is the first step? Come unto me. How we came. Because if we do come to him, then there's another step. Rest. How we did that? No. As a matter of fact, we have postponed all that. Matter of fact, is the last thing we want to do is rest. So I've been looking, reading, more thinking, more than anything else. I like for God to pull my scriptures together for me. I love him to pull the book together. I love for him to show me the things that I've been reading all my life and I really thought I understood but didn't. He makes mentions of things that we need to go back and study, look at. You know, some people know the next style that's coming out, but don't know Jesus yet. I'm not concerned about a lot of stuff that goes on in this world right now. I'm concerned about how Jesus is dealing with me. And same thing you should be. Because my faith is not hinged up on you. My faith is hinged up on him. So your faith is the same thing. We must come to a place where it's either Jesus or nothing. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1 and 5. We have not been able over the years to rightly divide the word, number one. We have not been able to see the difference. You know, we, we have got so many debates going on right now. You know, Facebook debates and everybody wants you to join a certain group, a certain club and and then get on there and argue about things that we really shouldn't be arguing about. But he says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant. How that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. In other words, now Paul is redirecting their attention because Paul is now talking to our audience that understand where the Jewish race has come through. Israelites. He said, now we're not ignorant. We all came through that. Of course, Paul is not speaking personally of himself, but what he is saying is that their salvation, they all did come through without a problem. How many Israelites died in the Red Sea? None. Not a one, did it? So he had, God had no problem getting them through that. To the other side, 
Not on that walkthrough on dry ground. Not one person. And if he did, he didn't mention it. But not one of those people died coming through. All of them came out. All of them came through. Now, I'm not sure if all of Israel came out of Egypt, but all the ones that did came through safely. Nobody was lost. He goes on to say, and we're all baptized under Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And did all eat the same spiritual meat? Even though he called it spiritual meat, it was really kind of natural. But yet it was spiritual because they didn't know where it came from. That's why they call it manna. What you call it. So they don't know. But God likens that manna to our spiritual meat. How many of you know what happened when they ate the spiritual meat? You know what it done? He said when they ate that and they ate it every day. God had them a clock. Every morning, evening. They collected groceries. Then, day before the Sabbath, he loaded them up you have for the buffet on Sunday. No, it was Saturday. But anyway, he loaded them up because he, he believed, you, you know, Sunday then is different than any other day. Right? So he loaded them up. And one of the things, looking at this because I think it's important, he didn't care how much money you got as long as you ate it all. Right? One thing you couldn't do is get it and then let it set up and save it. Anything that you saved turned to worms. Something so good for breakfast become maggots at lunch if you didn't eat it. So there's a lot of correlation there, but I'm looking at it from this standpoint. Now, if he fed them manna like twice a day, made sure they ate, and then there was a result from them eating the manna, you know what it said? There was not one sick one a feeble one, a weak one among them. Why? Because they was eating the man. He, when Jesus came and talked about the bread, he said the bread, the crumb, the bread is for the healing. So here they were being fed by God. They was healthy as ticks. And then they walked for 40 years in un unbelief, man, until you had to walk them to death. <laughs> That's all I can come up with. The Bible said that old generation died off. And all I can see is that he walked them to death. Oh, boy, here we go again. Till finally they didn't go again. God had raised up a whole new generation. Well, I'm saying that because, see, a lot of times there is the dimensions of God where we're walking at. You can tell where you're walking by what's happening to you. You can always tell where you're at spiritually by the things that happen to you. A lot of this stuff should not come as a surprise. But anyway, he says, they all did drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. And once again, he likens their drinking up from that rock is like the drinking that we drink from our rock. That rock was Christ, type. Right? So how often do you drink? They were drinking natural water in the desert. They had to survive. They didn't have any artificial H2O. They were drinking from the rock that followed them. 
It's like kind of like they had God on the spot. God wasn't leading them. He was following them. Because the reason why, because he had led them to that place where they could have made the jump over into the promised land. After that, he got to follow them now because it's around that same circle again. Around that same circle. But they're drinking. But here they're drinking because in order to survive, you got to have water. That's what gets me, Sister Booker. How do we think we can survive today without his spirit? If they needed him then, but all this is in type. And I think if it was, if we were living the literal deliverance of God, we could see it a lot clearer. Because there are things that we think doesn't affect us when we don't drink from his well. Yet, we don't see that it has affected us a whole lot. Just as even though they were drinking and walking, this is what the Bible said. But with many of them, God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. What is it that God could not be pleased about. They done came out, right? Huh? They done came out. Shouldn't he have been happy? Praise God, they came out of Egypt. Thank you. They should have been happy. But yet somehow in all of that, God said, I was not pleased with them at all. What could you possibly have done to make him not be pleased after that great and wonderful deliverance. You see, here he is. He takes these people, put them in the wilderness. He leads them out here, and it seems that it's so unfair that God would do such a great deliverance. You know, it's almost like when I got baptized in the water, in Jesus' name. Man, that's one of the best cleansing I've ever had in my life. Matter of fact, I felt like I lost sin. I felt like I lost the weight of sin. When he brought me up, I was so light, I felt like I was going to float. And man, at that moment, God bring me on to heaven. Don't leave me down here. I felt like, man, if there ever was a time to die, take me now. Because I know right now I'm feeling like real angelic. I felt like the second person in the Trinity, if that's such a thing. But I was feeling so good. But did you know that was not the end of the story? And most, just like most of these Israelites, when God brought them through that Red Sea and brought them out of Egypt, he should have took them on to heaven. Because everybody saved that they're going to be right there. They had a good worship service. They danced, tambourined it to death. That was the best day of their life. That's about the best it got for them. And after that, it was downhill all the way. Does this sound familiar? Does this sound familiar? Boy, today I got baptized in Jesus' name. I spoke into her. Whoa! I got How has it been since that day? Because you know what happened? They had a perception about God. Now, once you see God do some mighty stuff like that, your perception changed. But generally what happened, we have these ideas of what God is going to do. 
And, you know, we're looking for him to do what we think he's going to do. And he always does just the opposite. So here they are. He got, they come out and thinking, since he done all this, he's going to have everything ready for us. First time they get over there, man, to get a drink of water. You would think God would have had some sweet tea or something. But instead, it has some bitter water. And guess what? Now, this is what's wrong with Christian people today. Every time we find something bad, we always anticipate the worst. You ever see that? How many of y'all ever look at a situation and say, you know what? Thank you, Jesus. I know if this is happening, I know God is doing something greater than this. Y'all ever look at calamities in your life and get excited because you know if this is happening, God ain't went on vacation. Hmm? And he, I don't believe that the devil is any busier than God. I believe God well, really, he ain't got to be busy because he already, his word is so strong, man. He already said, you mind. So I, I don't have no conflict with God at all. And so I know that whatever God is bringing my way, I'm not ever anticipating what the devil's going to do. You know what I anticipate? I'm getting ready to see what God's going to do now. In everything, I want to be able to look at it and say, I see that. But let's just watch God now. Because God brought them in the wilderness. Their perception was off. Every time they came to a trial or a test, they anticipated the worst. They come to the bitter stream, the bitter water, First thing they say, oh, you done brought us out here to die. I should have stayed in the world. I didn't have it this bad. You never said that. I thought that. Yes. Tell the truth. Yes, I, I know. I told God, I was in about six months. I, I, I had a little comfort in there. I said, look. I said, now, <laughs> I understand you're trying to save me and everything. I said, but. I wouldn't really have this much problem. <laughs> I wouldn't have none of these kind of problems I'm having right now with you. Now, I know y'all laughing. I'm just telling you. Because ain't no sense me going to God and telling him I love him when he's killing me like that and I wasn't loving at all. Because I wasn't used to that. A lot of things he was bringing my way, I was not used to. And I was trying to get him to understand that when I got saved, this is not what I anticipated. Because every time I went to church, everybody was shouting and telling me how good God was and how you done this. And I'm sitting over here, man, I'm thinking, well, God, you got me down here living in the basement with my son and a dog. They shouting about everything. New washes. New drive. It, my, every day I got up, it was another trial. So I'm trying to figure out. Because they told me when I got saved, somebody said, man, everything going to be all right now. That's the biggest lie I've ever heard in my life. If everything ever went wrong in my life, it's when I got saved. Man, you don't know how many nights I cried. Saved. Because I was not having fun at all. Matter of fact, I was complaining. Every step of the way. Here is Israel. God brings them out. Every time something happened, they either blame God or they blame Moses. You know what our problem is today? Same, same thing. 
is either God's fault or somebody else's fault. But I tell you who is never at fault. I can tell you who ain't never at fault. God, can you see what they're doing to me? You probably don't see what you're doing to them. And you probably can't see what you're doing to him. And every now and then you get a chance to taste your own medicine. How many of you know you don't mind giving medicine to other people? But you don't like to take your own medicine. It don't taste good to you. Oh, I don't know why he's sending me through this. Why? Why wouldn't he? That's what I don't understand. Why would you think that God would save you and not bring you through everything necessary? Why do you think that somehow God would save you and all of a sudden be afraid to display you? He's not afraid. That's not one thing in this world that God is afraid of. He don't push panic buttons. He don't get excited. He doesn't stop being God because we change presidents. He was God when the Republicans was in. Guess what? He's still God. And you know what we need to anticipate? Not what the next political move is. Because in the midst of all the chaotic and craziness, if you're not careful, you're going to start to focus in on all that. And then the next thing you know, you're going to think that somehow what's going on is going to make your God look awful small. I don't see him being a small God. And first of all, I don't have to explain the world to anybody. I don't know what goes on. I don't know what makes people think like that. Well, yes, I do. We all know. They can't have a thing like that. They have a corner mind. Guess what can they, guess what they're going to think? Corner thing. People who live after corner minds going to think corner. And corner things is going to be their forte. Whether they, you know, you, you know, everything we call spiritual ain't spiritual. A lot of our spiritual stuff is corner. Yes. It is. So here they come out. And, but the Bible said he done all these things for a reason. This is the reason why I say sometimes we need to go back and slowly begin to unfold these things that he's given us examples to. Because we got people coming out of, supposedly coming out of the world, coming out of Egypt and all that. And if, if I really told you the truth tonight, a lot of people who came out of Egypt is more in Egypt now than they were when they were in what they call Egypt. Yeah. A lot of people more bound in church than they were even before they came to church. Because if you're not careful... You, you bring yourself into bondages that you're supposed to have been free from. A lot of people, not only, see, when I was out there, I didn't feel bad. I came into church. I felt free for a while. But then I let the fears and all the other things begin to put its hold on me. And I realized that we got bound by stuff that we can be free from, but we're afraid. Fear has taken the place of faith. And somehow we just cannot believe that God, even though he bought us out one day, we have doubts about what he can keep us. What he, can he really save us? Can he really be God? Can he do what he say he's going to do? And we want to see this without ever connecting with God. So after they crossed over, they started complaining. A long time ago, I began to realize the worst thing you can ever do in God is complain. 
Because the reason why, when you complain, you offend him. And the reason why I say that is because when you complain, especially if you say, you're telling God he don't know what he's doing. That's kind of offensive. You know, and when you start telling God he don't know what he's doing, he'll probably try to show you that you really don't know what you're doing because you know what he done with them? He let them all die. Overthrew them in the wilderness. Not because they was talking about the neighbor. It's about their murmuring and complaining. We have the Holy Ghost today. The Spirit of God in us. And we're still doing murmuring and complaining as if God is short. There's nothing in him that you can't have. What do I need to complain about? Man, I'm going to complain about the economy. I don't need to complain about the economy. The Bible says all the gold belongs to God. And cattle on a thousand hills. He know I like T-bones. He know I like ribeyes. He knows that. I'm not going to be fretting over the price of beef. Man, you see how the beef is? Don't eat it. That's all you got to do. But if I'm going to eat beef, I'm not going to worry about the price of beef. Because I realize he owned that and the gold. You know what that tells me? He can bless me with a steak sandwich every day. Do I want a steak sandwich? I ain't looking for that. <laughs> but he allowed many times these people they never really wanted to call on God until. Until. Only time they ever really wanted God to operate is when they got into trouble with something they couldn't do. I'm gonna need me a, I'm gonna need a water. Go get me a water, man. <coughs> I'm warming up. And when I warm up, get me get me the coffin. <coughs> but anyway. Here God will come and reveal himself to them. And this is the difference between you and them. And this is one thing that most people need to realize is that they didn't have God in them. God was just with them. But he wasn't living in them. So they had to focus their attention on the sinner where the tabernacle that represented where God resided in their camp. But they didn't have what you got right now. Because when they left the camp, went all out, you know, there was no visible or no real tangible or whatever you want to call of God's presence. So you didn't know whether you was going out to battle, whether God's going to be there or not. So generally you had to make sure, you know, God go before us, you know, go before us in battle. But now you get up every morning and walk out your door. Guess what? You ain't walking out by yourself. Now you have a new promise from God is that I will never leave you nor forsake you. You have the promise from God today that he will come and make his abode <coughs> with you. Thank you so much, man. I need that water. Thank you. Yeah, it got hot all at once, didn't it? So the children complained. And it made God upset. He said serpents. And that may be a reason why a lot of people send a lot of serpents in their life. <laughs> Man, that's why a lot of them seeing a lot of devils in their life because when they complained, you know what he done? He sent the serpents among them. Yep, sent the serpents among them and many of them died because they got bit by the serpents. Remember that? It was all because of their complaining. I don't know what God would have to do. And I've heard people over the years say, man, especially when their face begin to get small, well, man, we just need to see a miracle. Do you know I see many miracles in this Bible and not one miracle kept any of those people? Let 
those guys that died in the wilderness, man, God put on all kind of displays for them. Huh? Fireworks displays. You, you name it. When you got fire coming down out of heaven, clouds. I mean, if you can't believe God after all that, what would he have to do? What sign would God have to give you to make you believe? So all these outside things that God done for these people, no matter what they say, they saw that enemies, the unbelievers, get plagued with pestilence. They were untouched. They would have thought, you should have thought, well, you know, we must be special. Then they saw frogs and in every house with the earth. Boy, they was blessed. And then you get out and have one test. And all of a sudden, God, where are you at? How can we have the Holy Ghost come and have a test and then wonder where is God at? We, we you know, we, and the most important thing, someone posted this and I loved it. I want to post it myself. I wish God was reading Facebook prayers. Because there's a lot of praying going on there, but I wonder how many of them prayers is talking to God. Talking to Facebook ain't talking to God. Huh? Sounds good. Sure sound good. But what is wrong with talking to God? Everything you need, you need to talk to him about. And yet, we'll tell all our problems to everybody but Jesus. And yet at the end of the day, he is the only one that can help you. Because you know why he said, God is your helper. But yet we don't want to tell him. What is it that what is the hang up there? What is it? We can know something is wrong with us, and we won't talk to him about that. I'd rather talk to anybody but God, you know, that kind of attitude. Well, what do you think? After you get everybody's opinion, still ain't going to give you no faith. Why do I need everybody's opinion? I don't need one. And I believe as was Judge Joe Brown who said, in this house, the only opinion of mat that matters is mine. That's what Jesus said. In my house, the only opinion that matters is his. Yours don't even matter. You can go to God and tell him what you don't like, what you don't think you like, and what you ain't going to never like. And Lord knows, please don't tell him what you ain't going to never do. Please, worst thing you can ever do. Don't tell God, I, I ain't going to never talk to them. God's got a way. Man, he has a way of bringing things together. My worst enemy, I swore I would never, ever speak a word to him. I have one thing in my mind. I was trying to get over the fact that I want to hurt him bad. You know what God does? Oh. He made me pick this dude up and give him a ride. God has such a sense of humor. So I learned early on, quit telling God what you ain't going to do. Don't tell God that. Because he's out to make a liar out of you because let every man be a lie. And God be true. So the best thing to do, just keep living. Don't get hung by your tongue. Talk less. Ponder more. Because you never know what God's going to do before this is over. So Moses prayed for the people. Did it change anything? He prayed for the people. He, he even 
realize even his friend for the people wasn't going to help them. You know, he, 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 he uh, constructed a song called the Song of Moses. You see, him, you see him singing it in the book of Revelation. That's why I think people need to study prophecy too because if you study prophecy, you wouldn't be all out here in the left field. But anyway, the Song of Moses was being sung and most people think that that was a song of jubilation. But in 31st chapter of Deuteronomy where he, the song was sung, it was not about goodness coming. You know what's really bad is when God tells these people, this is what you're going to do. I already know you're going to do it. And ain't nothing going to change that. You're going to do these things. And here's what I'm going to do to you when you do it. God is almost like my mother was. And she said, well, Lee and Jean, I'm going to whoop you when we get home. I use that because she probably heard it more than me. But Lee and Jean, when you get home, I'm going to whoop you. You know what? I don't care how much fun you was having that day. No, no, I, I, no but you know. You might as well have fun, run, because when you get home, I don't care what my mama was doing. I don't care you try to make her forget. She had a mind like an elephant. When she got home, you think she done forgot. Lee and Jean, get in here. No, no, no. You heard that, you heard that a lot more than me. I felt sorry on the way home. I was happy all the way home, but I knew as close as we got, she was dragging in. Because, <laughs> you know, my mama promised you a whooping. She delivered. Can you believe that if God promised you a whooping, he's going to deliver? That's what the 31st chapter of Deuteronomy done. God told him exactly I know you hard-headed, and you ain't going to do what I tell you to do. You ain't going to mind me, but I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to get you later, and you will not escape. Praise God. I used to try to go to bed early. Don't do that either. That's where bad, bad, bad. Sleep didn't bother them. Man, ain't nothing like getting woke up. With a strap. That's, you wake up. You don't know where you're at. You got. Oh, it's bad. But anyway. So. Because many times we. We do use our words. For the wrong purposes. We use our tongue for the wrong thing. And. The. Tongue should be used. To promote life, to promote love, and to promote light. That's what your tongue should be used for. See, we need, we need a, when I, like I said, all the information we're getting hadn't transformed us. So we need to have a transforming word to transform the way we talk, of course, the way we think, because a lot of things we say, it's coming straight from the heart. We don't want it to, but it is. Okay? Well, you know, I, I, I'm trying. See, we've got to get past the trying part now and just do it. We'll never know if we don't do it. And I know it's a lot easier to stand back and say, well, you know, God, uh, I'm trying to believe. Well, what do you think he's trying to do? When you're trying to believe, you think he lighten up? You think he... Gonna give you less tests because you're trying. You'll come out better going through your tests and passing and waiting for the next one. Because you're moving. In this is growth. It's not it's no stagnant place. Your 50-year-old testimony ain't no good today. You need something new. You need to have something great going on in your life. So you move from faith to faith. Most people are still stuck. 
because we have never recognized what our test was for. We're sitting here blaming devils. Man, the devil, he's trying, to, he's trying to forget the devil, what he's trying to do. Anticipate what God is doing. Oh, the devil trying to make me sick. Go ahead on it. Because I'm anticipating healing. The devil trying to mess up my life, messing up my home. Good. Because now I'm anticipating peace. See, everything that comes your way, you need to have a different anticipation. Most people are dying because they talk death. There's too much dead stuff coming out of our mouth. Man, you know, you know how we talk. We just be joking, though. Then you kill me. <laughs> Probably do, too. <laughs> you know, in more ways than one. But here we are getting hung by a tongue and then we want to go to God knowing that we don't have the confidence we need in him. It's real simple. If you lack anything in God, you know what you got to do? Just ask. Just ask. You ain't got to fake none of that. Just ask. If you know you don't believe, Heal me. Because unbelief is a sickness. Unbelief is a sickness unto death. Okay? That was the first sin. I know you think it was him taking the fruit, but it wasn't. Unbelief is. They had to unbelieve in order to believe to take the fruit. So, unbelief is sinful. Unbelief is death. You can't have unbelief in talking about I'm going to be saved. You're dead. You're dying. You're eating death. That's why you're more concerned about how you die and where you die and when you die. Because you're caught up in that. And you would rather talk about dying than to talk about living. I had to get over that very hump. I'm going to be honest with you. I turned 60-something. And, you know, as you get older, whew, life changes. It changes greatly. And you get looking at the bitch words, and you got people your age is dying. Do you know how easy it is, Sister Booker, to start thinking, now I'm 60. Whew, five more years, I'm 65. Whew, that's pretty old. And then you get to seeing things like wheelchairs, and canes, you know, all these old age pictures started popping up in your mind. You know, you, you, you don't, you know, you can't help but get old, but most of us got a perception. And it becomes very confusing. Because, see, you get angry with yourself sometimes because you just ain't got that get up and go kind of stuff no more. You got a good thought process. Man, I can have, I built the Empire State Building sitting on the couch. But you see, I don't have the real get up and go like I used to, and it, it really bothers me. Because I really want to run like I used to run. I want to be able to go like I used to go. My mind is still racing, but my body slowed way down. Way down. And facing the reality of that is not easy. So trying to, to learn how to grow in that grace and knowledge and how to fit in God's purpose and plan and not yours. See, many times it's that, uh, let me see here. When we talk about them in the wilderness, they didn't probably have trees and shade trees, none of that kind of stuff, but God took care of them. 
My problem today is this, is that if God could do that and he wasn't living in them, why do we have less faith today with him living in us? You, you, know, you know what I'm beginning to realize? We've been looking in the wrong mirror. See, there's a certain thing that God says about us is hard to believe because it's a miracle. And it's just so hard for any of us to accept the fact that what he says is really true about you. You know, I, I used to jump on my friends because I felt, still feel, probably in some ways. I mean, I don't want to shortchange God in any kind of way. But at the same time, I realized that there is a grace of development. How many was here when Adam was created? Nobody. How much input you think Adam had in the process? Any? You know, that's what gets me. Now we can go back and believe that God created Adam out of dust without any kind of input. And not only did he create him out of dust, but created Adam to be one of the smartest men ever created. Without any help from Adam, God did that. You believe that? Now think about that. God did that without any input. Then have no help. And yet, seeing what he done with Adam, now he comes and says that he has made you a new creation. Do you think he might need your help? Do you think he needs your help? Come on now. I, I, I know, I know the, the political or the Christian correct answer to that is no. But the reality of it is, you want to tell you the reality of it is, we really believe that God needs our help. Right? Because we know how we're supposed to look. Right? It is some Adam was born, created, didn't even know how he's supposed to look. Can you imagine him raising up after God get through him and say, hey, I, Lord, I see what you're doing, but you see, I want you to name me, not Adam, and name me Kelly. Take all that hair off right there. And go tee me up. That's the way I want to be, that's the way I want to look. God didn't do that. God made him in his likeness and in his image. And yet at the same time, we don't know what that is. Right? Do we? Because it was more than just the outward man he was talking about. Because that dust man was not going to be like God because that dust man goes back to the dust. So there was a part of him that came after the breath of life was breathed into his nostril that made him like God. Do you know why he breathed in your nostril? Do you know why he gave you the Holy Ghost? Because that is the only way you'll ever be like him. But what about us who don't want to live in the Holy Ghost? Guess what? You will never be like him. We forget. The Holy Ghost ain't one of those things just to make us feel good on Sundays. It's Christ in you. It's the hope of glory. So it's not like 
I got the Holy Ghost. And then we imagine once we get the Holy Ghost, you know where our perception go? If I've heard this a thousand times, now I got the Holy Ghost, saved, all this, uh, hold on till I get my reward in heaven. Do you know when Jesus saved you, he brought his reward with him with, to give to you? What reward do you want? You're not getting rewarded for what you've done. If you go back in the book of Isaiah, he's sharing his bounty with you. It's his bounty is your reward. His victory is your victory. His peace is, you know what our problem is? We're still trying to get our own stuff. He wants to give you what he won. He was the one that conquered everything. He don't need it, but you do. And so he's trying to give you what he has won for you. When he saves you, he ain't trying to hold back any part of that. He did not take that beating on Calvary for nothing. He did not suffer more than any other man for nothing. He didn't get his back plowed for nothing. Didn't wear a crown of thorns for nothing. You know who that was for? It was for you. And then all of a sudden, he's going to get in you and want you just to suffer for no reason? No. That's why you got to begin to see something here. Everything come your way, anticipate. God is in the midst here. Don't know what he's trying to show me. But I'm going to hang right here with him. Because I believe that God knows better than I do. Praise God. So the tabernacle he put in the middle of them. We still have a, a structural worship and not real temple worship. See, we got more confidence in the structure than we do in the temple. Where is the temple at? Know ye not? Guess where, he, guess where God resides? In his temple. You saved and talking about you don't know where God is? He's in his temple. Wait a minute. You mean in me? No, you're not. Your body is the temple. It's his church. It's in you. We can no longer Talk about doing, we must become the church. Now, when I'm talking about doing it, man, be. Everything about God is being. In Him, we live and have our, not our doings. Not our doings. In him we live and have our be in. Because you got to become before you even think about trying to do. A lot of people want to do stuff without becoming. First call of God is to become. Praise God. Anybody got a question? Statement. Well, I'm just saying, I, 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 I know I'm probably processing things a little too quick, maybe. I don't know. But I'm just, I think that most people don't understand is that they're in a wilderness, but you ain't got to stay there. But most people stayed there because we made the wilderness the, the end. We really did. We really feel like it's a, a better place to be because we can brag about how many devils we're fighting every day. And yet, there is a place in God. I began to, the other night, this story came up to me. And like, it, I could hear God impressing in my spirit. 
Do you need to step over? See, we stepped in. When they came out of Egypt, they stepped in, but they never stepped over. There is another step that has to be taken. You can't claim all these promises of God riding in the wilderness. Now, let me tell you this here. Because most people have settled for the wilderness because God has been able to provide them with food, shelter, and clothing. That's all they want. That's all they desire. Don't get me wrong. That's all well and good. But Jesus didn't come to die to give you that. You could get that without it. Right? You didn't, you didn't eat. It sounds good. But when we begin to say stuff, boy, I got food, rain, and all, there would be content. Fine. But he came to give you more than that. You would have got that anyway. That's common. He's going to feed birds. Guess what? He's going to feed you too. So there was a lot more to it. But they got comfortable having their daily needs met to when it got to a place where it looked like it would be more difficult. They came back to that report. You know, many of us, we heard the 10. We ain't heard the two. Oh, Brother Wilson. Uh, now, you know, I don't believe God wants you to, I don't, he don't want you to do that. Now, he, he wants you to use common sense now. Now, you see how big them devils is over there? I, I'll just stay on over here. At least we fighting, but not those big ones. Do you know the difference between your fight and mine? I ain't fighting. When you step over, you quit. You know why? Because he said, the battle It's not yours. Yeah, well, y'all pray for me. I'm going through a battle. Okay. So what is my prayer going to do about your battle? I can't get you out of that battle. Because if you believe Jesus, instead of you asking me to pray about you going through your battle, you look to him and say, Lord, this is not mine. The battle is yours. You know what, what's mine? The victory. Oh, brother, now that's just too, I, no, that's just too simple. Isn't this strange? Why can't we believe the simple things? Well, I, you think I'm going to stand back here and, and let it happen? The battle is not yours. It's the Lord's. They haven't done it to you. Don't that just make a mess of the creed? Here I have been inflicted, conflicted, afflicted. And you know what he said? They ain't doing that to you. You persecuting me? I can see Paul now. They throwing rocks and hitting him all upside the head. <laughs> That's got to be such a beautiful sight. And the Lord is saying, "They ain't doing it to you, Paul. They doing it to me." Well, Jesus, I wish you'd come on down here. Then. <laughs> I wish you'd just come on down here and take care of this thing, because right now I'm feeling. Some things. I'm sure. That'd be hard to understand, wouldn't it? Now, do you ever feel like that? That you suffering? And then you go to the Bible, and God gave you these encouraging words. People are mistreating you, dogging you out. You go to God, and you want him to say something like, I'm going to kill him for you. 
And he said these encouraging words. They haven't done it to you. They done it to me. Don't that just bug you? All right. Yeah, y'all need to cut it out. <laughs> so anyway. Okay. Well, let, 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 me, let me say this. Have we wanted to know the God of heaven or the God of our culture? They're two different ones. See, Paul talked about you can preach a different Jesus. So we have a, a cultural Jesus. It's not necessarily a biblical Jesus. It gives us the morals of our culture. And we have so integrated so many of those things into what we call church. Expectations and different things like that. But that's why the Bible tells you, know God. Know his love, his incomprehensible love. We don't spend time trying to know God, but, but we're very much aware of all of our cultural stuff. You do good, you know, you get plaques. And I'm not sure what they're good for, but, you know, you get plaques, and it does do something to your little ego, you know. On the wall, greatest man ever lived. It does something for you, you know what I'm saying? Even if, even if it's not true. So we, we do have, again, the mind. Certain things, when you got saved, you got born again. We very rarely ever allow that born again guy to show up. We suppress him. Because a born-again guy doesn't operate like I would. So I only call the born-again guy up every now and then so he can watch me do my thing. <laughs> and then if it's good, we'll swear the Holy Ghost was powerful that night. Right? But if it's bad, he will say, I need to pray more. I need to do more. But most of this that we are trying to do more and pray more for is not for the Holy Ghost to work as much as for us to work better keeping the Holy Ghost subjected so that we can perform our thing and tell God, you know, be like the ones in the, in the Bible said, you know, we cast out devils in your name, not only saying but he said, but I never knew you. So, I understand what you're saying, but until we get really born again, we don't understand the fact that it's a different altogether. Okay, you can't 
most people are trying to serve God out of their carnal mind. They're trying to serve God from a flesh standpoint. They want Ishmael to be the one. But it's Isaac, the happy one. See, there is one in you that's really happy. And then there's that other one of you that ain't happy. Always in conflict. I read this, and I'm going to let you go with this. I read, find out, I saw someone finally, not that I think I'm right. I can't tell you I'm totally right on everything. I have no idea, but I do know what God shows me. And you know, we went through this thing going with, uh, back in the 80s, we was having spiritual warfare. We're going to do spiritual warfare. And at first it sounded good because we're going to bring down God over the cities, the, the devils over the cities. And, and it seemed like it was working. You know, you go to a city, we walk around. I go to a city, I ride around, pray. But then I realized See, the Bible, war, uh, spiritual warfare, you know what it is? It's your corner mind fighting against the Spirit of God. Your corner mind is enmity, it's not subject. No, it can't be, right. So, the real spiritual warfare is not me pulling down. The spirit is over the cater. Because the Bible tells you, you, you the one need to cast down imaginations, knowledge, things that exalt itself against the knowledge of God. It would look good, look like we're really doing something. Like we went, carried sign. You know, I've seen people say, Jesus is Lord over the cater. You think too small, friend. <laughs> if you think he's just lost over the kitty, you're thinking way too small. It is strange how we go through all this stuff. It sounds good, but until he become Lord in your life, until he become the Lord in your life, you can carry a sign, you can walk down here, Talk about, now how stupid can it be? We're going to carry a sign, stop the violence. Did everybody turn the guns in? Somebody must not have prayed then. They started walking with signs, and I see more people getting killed. Are you telling me God ain't answering prayer? I mean, we think a lot of activity means that God is moving. It's just a lot of flesh doing a lot of things and a, a, a show thing. You know what's going to happen when God's people get reunited individually. You don't step over with a crowd. You can only step over when you see it. When you see it, go after it. When you see it, Go after it. That concludes our uh, ceremony tonight.